In our last installment, we continue to, to examine the calls to action God inspired the Apostle Paul to give in order to stir Christians to take action, in order to make sure that they were vigorously pursuing the will of God in their lives. Now, the, the calamities the early church was facing required that they take the proper, the proper action, which involved their relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Because it wasn't just about doing something to save the flesh. We all want to escape suffering and pain and so on and so forth. But the most important thing, the most important thing for us to understand is our relationship with God doesn't, no matter what the physical circumstances, circumstances are, is what's important. We all are looking forward to the culmination of this age and the return of Jesus Christ. This is something that we yearn for. But the fact is, brethren, the end of our physical lives could come at any moment. We very much yearn to see the fulfillment of the day of the Lord. But let's be mindful. Let's be mindful of the warning the prophet Amos gave to the people of ancient Israel who were not prepared for the judgment that befell them. Let's notice this in Amos chapter 5 and verse, verse 18. Amos chapter 5 and verse 18. Now this may seem unusual to those who are looking forward to this event, but at the beginning we want to just pause to consider what Amos is saying to the people of ancient Israel. Amos 8, I'm sorry, Amos chapter 5 and verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Brethren, this is a very serious warning. And what this tells us that the day of the Lord will be darkness for those who are only focused on saving the flesh and neglect the all important opportunity to be in a right relationship with God. If all we're looking for is the day of the Lord, is the coming of Jesus Christ, and not preparing, as it says here, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. So the question is, what is our motivation for desiring the day of the Lord? That is what we take away from this admonition of the prophet Amos. So th thus far then, we have examined the call to action for us to conduct our lives with reverent fear so that we do not fail to make the grade of qualifying to receive the promised gift of salvation God has in store for us. Because it's, it, it is a gift. It is not something that no one can ever earn in a trillion billion lifetimes. It is a gift from God. Next, we examine the call to be all the more diligent to make our calling and election sure by doing the things that will enable us to remain under the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Last time, we examine the call to hold fast to the commitment we made to God and Christ, a baptism, by making sure our first love, the love of a spousal to Jesus Christ, is kept on fire. Closely connected to that call was the call to draw near to God, to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Having 
access to the throne, throne of grace it made possible through our great high priest, our merciful and faithful high priest, Jesus Christ. As we learned last time, who was tempted in every respect, just as we are tempted, and yet did not sin. Paul now continues the theme of Jesus Christ as our high priest. In the next call to action, we will examine. So let's take a look. Let's continue on with these calls. Let's please turn with me back to the book of Hebrews. And you may want to put a mark in that because we'll be going back and forth to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Hebrews 6 and verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on. New International, New American Standard states, press on. Let us go on, or let us press on to perfection. The Greek interlinear renders that full growth, we should go on. So we should press on to perfection or press on to full growth. Not, a, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Now for all intensive purposes, there should have been no chapter break from the verse we just read to the prior verses in this book. Because when Paul begins this section with, with therefore, we must examine what comes before in order for us to understand the context of this call to action. Now, even though we, can, we should, we, we can begin in verse 1 and chapter 5, let's, let's start in verse, verse 8. Chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Hebrews 5 and verse 8. This is from the New American Standard rendering. Paul writes, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, we human beings are refined by suffering. It, the, it, the purpose of suffering is to purge our impurities, as we know, as gold is purified by fire, and so on and so forth. So that is the purpose of suffering. It purges our Im impurities if, there's a condition, if we respond and take it in the right spirit. Now, some people can, some can rebel against it, and it does them no good. But if we take God's correction in the right spirit, then we, it purges our impurities. But as we read here about Jesus Christ, Christ's perfecting was not the perfecting of his moral character, but the completion of the process of training to become our high priest. Think about it, brethren. Christ is intimately familiar with each and every one of us. He formed and shaped the first man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He knows us inside out, upside down. He knows our thoughts, our feelings, and so on. No one knows about us more than God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now, even with all this perfect knowledge about us, Jesus Christ became as one of us to learn what it's like to suffer while remaining perfectly obedient. Think about it, brethren. This was the process that God the Father and Jesus Christ established so that Jesus Christ can learn, learn what it was to suffer while remaining perfectly, perfectly obedient. Now, I'd like to read verse 8 from the Greek interlinear. 
because even though it basically says the same thing, you will notice where it places obedience. It says Greek, this is the Greek inter, interlinear trans, transliteration. Though being a son, he learned from the things which he suffered the obedience. You see, there's a little shifting the words a little around, or shifting the words around a little bit gives you a different flavor, a different emphasis. But nonetheless, it shows here he learned. Jesus Christ learned from the things that he suffered. One of the things he learned, their obedience. What he experienced, what he learned, perfectly fitted him in every way to become the source of eternal salvation, as we just read. Continuing in verse 10. We are still with the New American Standard. Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Mel Melchizedek. Concerning him he have much to say, and it is hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing. For though by, by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So we see that Paul goes on to show that Jesus Christ was designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This was Christ's role from the time of the sin of Adam and Eve until the time God gave the priesthood to the sons of Aaron. Now, even though Jesus Christ needed no training as a priest, he experienced life in the flesh to gain first-hand experience of what it's like to suffer, as we, as we, as we just read. Since his, his resurrection, Christ has taken back the role of the priesthood. But note, brethren, notice that Paul was concerned, as we see here. Paul was concerned about the Hebrews' inability to grasp the awesome reality of Christ being a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's a quote, from, of course, from Psalm 110 and verse 4. They, were, they grew up with a physical high priest after the, in, the line of, in the line of Aaron. But again, Paul is showing here the, the, the infinitely superiority of Jesus Christ. And the reason for the, the, they, they could not understand, the reason that they had a hard time grasping this is that they had become dull of hearing. As Paul brings out, you have become dull, it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. That's the last part of, of verse 11. Now, it's not that they could not hear, but their, senses, their sense of hearing has become dull. Now, initially, they heard loud and clear when, and they were responsive to the voice of the master. They heard the voice of Jesus Christ loud and clear. Remember, some of these individuals actually heard the voice of Jesus Christ. And we recall what Christ said to his disciples in Matthew 13, Matthew 13 and verse 16. Matthew, Matthew 13 and verse 16, Jesus states, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. The gift of spiritual discernment is a tremendous blessing from God, but it must be guarded jealously. Now, it is not incidental, it is not an incidental matter that Jesus Christ gave the identical admonition about hearing to all seven churches in Revelation, beginning with the very members Paul originally wrote 
this letter to? We're just going to read the first one. In Revelation 2 and verse 7. Revelation 2 and verse 7. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the last thing that is stated, that is said to all the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The identical admonition is repeated in chapter 2, the same chapter, verse 11, verse 17, verse 29, chapter 3, verses 6, 13, and 22. Six other times, seven times in total. The identical admonition, he who has an ear, let him hear. Brethren, just as in so many things in the physical, we take our ears for granted until we have a problem with them. Our ears are constantly being assaulted with all types of noise pollution, which puts our hearing in great danger. Now, it has been shown that sustained loud noises can wreck the internal organs of a mouse and eventually kill it. This is, of course, experiments that they perform. They wouldn't do this with people, even though there are insane individuals who probably does this. But the intense, loud noises can actually wreck our organs. See, God created us as, as holistic beings. One affects the other. Things that affect one thing affects the other thing. So the damage caused to our physical hearing by noise pollution may be subtle in some cases, but nonetheless very serious. But Christ's admonition to the church involved the use of the spiritual faculty of hearing. He is telling us, Jesus Christ is telling us, brethren, since we have been given ears to hear, we must use it and take care of it. He also warns us in several other places, take heed what you hear. This is in Mark 4 and verse 24. And also take heed how you hear in Luke 18 and verse 18. So we must exercise discernment in what we hear and how we hear. Now, going back to what Paul wrote back in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse, and verse 11 concerning the fact that they were dull, dull of hearing, the word translated dull, as in dull of hearing, is an idiom. Literally, literally lazy as to one's ears, and means to be slow to understand, with an implication of laziness slow and sluggish in mind, as well as in the ears. So what then we see here was this was the condition of the members of the body of Christ who came out of Judaism and had allowed themselves to get into. These Hebrews had become mentally and spiritually what the loafers are in the world, too sluggish to bestir themselves, too lazy to make any effort at improvement. They were spiritually loafers, so to speak. They were spirit spiritual sluggards, lazy. Now, someone who is lazy expects someone else to do the job for them instead of doing it themselves. Or they simply don't put forth the effort to get the job done themselves. But one thing is self-evident. One thing is absolutely self-evident, brethren, is that growth, whether physical or spiritual, cannot be outsourced or delegated. You know, we live in a world where you want to outsource everything. Have somebody else do it. Not so with growth. 
much personal effort is required. If you want to grow, you must put forth the effort. And we must also understand, brethren, is that length of time is not related to maturity. Length of time on this earth is not related to maturity. Paul reproved them for their state of inertia based on the fact that they had been converted long enough to help to be of help to other, the ones who were just coming along. And instead of being help to others, they were in need of being grounded once again in the ABCs of God's truth. So far from having the capacity to chew solid food, their condition called for that which was suited only to that of a baby with stunted growth, milk. They were immature, as Paul states here. Whereas they should be teachers, they still need to be taught the basic. Now, all Christians are to be teachers. Christ described this basic requirement in Matthew 5 and verse 14. This is a basic, this is a requirement for all Christians. In Matthew 5, as we know, Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5 and verse 14, Jesus states, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light, Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And the reality is, brethren, our example the way we conduct our lives is an extremely powerful teacher. As the old saying goes, what you do speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. Or simply put, actions speak louder than words. Just some food for us to think about, some food for thought. So teachers then teach in many ways. Now Paul goes on to elaborate, elaborate by pointing out their failure to fully utilize what they had been given. They should have maturing spiritually, just as surely as an infant in the normal progression of maturity begins with milk and after a while proceeds to taking solid food. So let's continue in Hebrews, Paul continues, uh, dropping down to Hebrews 5, Hebrews 5 and verse 13. Hebrews 5 and verse 13, we're going to read this from the Green's literal translation. For everyone partaking of milk is without experience in the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for those full grown. And note what he's saying here. Having exercised the faculties through habit for distinction of both good and bad. So here we find the crux of the problem. Someone without experience, as this translated puts it, or unskilled, in the word of righteousness, is simply unable to progress spiritually. Now, we know what it means to be without experience in doing something physical. If you ask someone to do a job with little or no experience in doing it, what type of quality of workmanship you think you'll get? Now, we're not talking about something where they, you know, they can wing it, so to speak. They can fake it. This is a specific task that's required experience. Now, something we may have noticed, brethren, 
is that some of those who have been blessed with exceptional talents, whether it's in the music arts or whatever kind of thing, some of, someone who, is, who have been blessed with these talents in some area are always practicing to perfect their skills. Just like a pianist, just prior to giving a concert, would spend hours and hours, day after day, practicing. Why? Why is that? Well, there's a principle, brethren. There's a principle, and the principle is nothing in this physical lasts for any period of time without constant maintenance. I'm sure we're all aware of this. Nothing in this physical lasts for any period of time without constant maintenance, whether it's a skill or whatever it is. But there's also a more deeper reality, a fact. A fact that nothing in this physical will last, period. Everything that is physical has an expiration date. Everything. Now, as, as Paul is showing here, you can't put the cart before the horse. That is, feeding solid food to a baby before the baby's body has matured enough to handle it. It simply won't work. Now, Paul fails to face a similar problem when he dealt with the church, with the church members in Corinth. Let's notice this in 1 Corinthians Chapter 3 and verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul writes, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able to receive it. You are still not able, for you are, con you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? We note here, brethren, Paul considers these individuals as brethren, that is, members of the body of Christ. But in spite of the designation, there was a problem that he could not speak to them as individuals who were becoming spiritually mature. There were not, he could not speak to them that way. But there were still babes in Christ. That is, immature Christians. Every Christian, every Christian must begin as an infant. And there is no shame. That's all we all began as human beings, physical human beings. That's, that's the process that God established. We all began as infants. And there's no shame to be an infant. But we should grow up in understanding, in our understanding of and an obedience to God's wisdom revealed in Jesus Christ and his word. We should grow up in our understanding of these, brethren. To remain infants is as, is as unnatural and unacceptable in the spiritual realm as it is in the physical. So the problem Paul was addressing here was not confined by any means to the Jewish Christians. To go from milk to solid food requires of necessity that the milk have been assimilated. Now back again in Hebrews 5 and verse 17, Paul, there's a, there's a, a, a phrase Paul uses as translated in this, literally, without experience in the word of righteousness. The way we gain experience is by constant application of God's word to our lives thereby having our spiritual senses exercised as an athlete exercises or train his body. Paul is addressing a common problem. 
to Christians in all ages. They fail to exercise their spiritual senses in that they are not walking closely with God. That's, just root, that's the crux of the problem. They are not closely following the good shepherd, listening closely to his voice, and proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. All of this results all this, brethren, result in their inability to discern good and evil. That's the end result of this all. Inability to discern good and evil. And the reality is, immaturity is not just for the mentally lazy, but results when we resist the truth of God's word because of, of our hearts and minds find it unpalatable. For an example of this, we're not gonna turn there. You can just turn there yourselves. Uh, you can refer to John chapter six and verse 60. Remember when Jesus Christ was talking about being, they must eat his bread and drink his blood and so on. There, there were those that said, this is a hard saying. This is, this is tough, we cannot accept. We cannot accept this. And sure, they did not accept this. That results in spiritual immaturity. The mark of spiritual immaturity is our inability to make spiritually sound judgments based on God's word. Now, in light of all that we have just covered then, we can understand that the, the therefore, that is, why Paul issued the call to action. So let's go back again, Hebrews chapter six and verse one. Hebrews chapter six and verse one, as we said, we have to mark that spot, which I didn't. Hebrews six and verse one says, New American Standard, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. Word can also be translated full growth, perfection. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Now let's stop there and look at a word here. The word translated laying is the Greek, the Greek word is katabalo. Katabalo, and this word can mean to throw down, to cast down. So, so the term not laying again should be rendered more accurately, not casting down. I mean, it makes more sense from what Paul is saying here. Paul is urging the Hebrews that the foundation that is, and he, and he lists all the things here, repentance from dead works and so on, that is the foundation that has already been laid. You don't cast it down, you don't destroy it, you don't throw it down. So the, 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 the foundation that had, has already been laid was not to be cast down or overthrown. And you go on from there progress made towards perfection. The problem that we face is standing still is a sure recipe for falling backwards. There can be no such thing as spiritually standing still. It's like being on this treadmill. If, you, if, you don't, if you're not moving on a treadmill, you're, eventually you're gonna go backwards and of course fall off the treadmill. You, you have to put forth the effort to not only keep in place, but to progress, to move forward. So Paul encourages here, Paul encourages us here to go on a journey. This journey is on to maturity. Let us go on to perfection or to spiritual maturity. But any forward progress one makes must be built on the foundation that has already been laid. It must be built on the foundation that has already been laid. And of course, he lays out 
the basic doctrines, these are the foundational doctrines that we're all familiar, we all familiar with. And as we know, a builder, when he, when he has laid his foundation, leads working on it and builds upon it. He doesn't throw it down and start all over again. He builds upon the foundation. So having the correct understanding of what Paul is saying here about not throwing down, casting down the foundation, let's look at some ways that we can go on to perfection. The first way we're going to examine is Going on to perfection require that we have a solid foundation. Going on to perfection, brethren, requires that we have a solid foundation. This is a starting point. Now, this may be, may be self-evident from what Paul is saying. You don't want to cast down your foundation. But the reality is, Sometimes we have to take a close examination of that foundation. You have to take a good look at it. Make sure there are no cracks. Make sure there are no, no, none of those stones have become dislodged or, re, or whatever. Again, going on to perfection required that we have a solid foundation. Let's notice the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 7 and verse 24. Matthew 7 and verse 24. We are quite familiar with these, these, these words. Therefore, Christ says, whoever hears. Now, let's key in on that term hears because we have, we have already covered a lot of things about the ears and hearing already. So whoever hears these saying of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And of course, we know who that rock is. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Each and every one of us is fully accountable for the foundation upon which we built our house. And we know that there can be no other foundation to be built upon, to be, to, for our house to be built on except the rock. As Paul states in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, you don't have to turn there, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10, Paul states, this is Green's literal translation according to God's grace given to me as a wise master builder I laid a foundation but another builds on it but let each one be careful how he builds Paul says be very careful be very careful for no one is able to lay any other foundation besides the one having been laid who is Jesus Christ. So Paul issues a caution to the church that they better be very careful on what they are building their foundation on. Now we have witnessed an, on, an ongoing problem over the years in that many did not build, build their foundation on Jesus Christ. And when the rain descended, when the floods came, their houses were swept away. Brethren, the reality is the rain has not stopped. The floods have not subsided. So this continues to be an ever-present danger. 
Now, the opening, the, opening, the opening remark of Jesus Christ highlights the root cause of this problem. Remember Christ said, whoever hears these saying of mine and does them. So the root cause of the problem is not hearing and not doing. If there is no hearing, there can be no doing. If you don't hear something, you're ignorant. You're totally clueless. But remember, God has given us ears to hear. If there's no hearing, there can be no doing. But doing must follow the hearing. In order for the hearing to be of any lasting value. Let's notice Jesus Christ's instruction back in John. John chapter 10 and verse 1. Back in John, book of John, chapter 10 and verse 1, Jesus states, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is the thief and the robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and notice what it says here, and the sheep hear his voice. Notice again the spiritual faculty of hearing. How critically important for us. Critically important it is for us. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet, they will by no means follow a stranger. Why? Because the sheep know his voice. They will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. How about us, brethren? How about us as, as the sheep of God? Are we tuned in to the voice of the shepherd? Are we tuned in to the voice of the shepherd? Brother, notice here again the critical importance of the sheep being in tune with the voice of the shepherd. The life of the sheep is totally dependent on the shepherd. Our lives, brethren, our lives is totally dependent on our shepherd, Jesus Christ. He laid his life down so that we can be given the opportunity to live, to have life. But note again the critical relationship of the sheep to the shepherd. The critical relation is the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. So this is the basis then. This is the basis for building a solid foundation. It's to, the basis is to hear the voice of the shepherd and take action. <clears throat> and being dull of hearing is a guarantee that we will not we will not have a solid foundation. Let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 33. And notice what it says here in this couple of verses here. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 31. So they come to you as my people do. They sit before you as my people. And notice again the hearing. They, and they hear your words. But they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song. Of one who has a pleasant voice. And can play well on an instrument. Notice what he says here again. For they hear your words, these are the words of God, but they do not do them. 
these words of condemnation not only applied, applied to physical Israel in their day, but also to spiritual Israel in our day. Without hearing and doing, one simply has no foundation to build on. That is the reality of it. Without hearing and doing, one simply does not have a foundation to build on. The next thing we like to examine is going on to maturity require that we continue to count the cost. Going on to maturity require that we continue to count the cost. Now, we are familiar with the term count the cost. But counting the cost did not end when we decide to accept the invitation God the Father extended to us to come to him and to his son. It didn't end here. He said, okay, I've counted the cost, that's it. Let's move on. Not quite. Counting the cost is an ongoing reality all of us must do. As disciples, we must daily deny ourselves, take up our stake, and follow Christ, as it says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. But the spiritual resources we need to complete the building of our spiritual structure are continually being depleted. Often by ourselves, we do not have unlimited resources. It takes resources, it takes spiritual material to build a building. Let's notice this again, just, to re just as a refresher, in Luke chapter 14. That's what Jesus Christ said here. Luke chapter 14 and verse 28. Luke chapter 14 and verse 28. For which of you intend to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation, he is not able to finish it. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was, not, as, and was not able to finish. Dropping down to verse, 20, verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, how many building projects we have seen or heard came to a screeching halt because the money ran out before the structure was completed. I'm sure we've heard or seen this from time to time. When we counted the cost, it's not that we thought that often by ourselves we would have the resources required that what was required. No, he didn't think, okay, I have all these resources, I can make it. What was required of us, brethren, was our total commitment. Our total commitment. And as we came to learn, the gospel is absolutely free, but it costs everything we have. Everything. Counting the cost at the beginning of our journey meant that we had to recognize that we enter a life of discipleship through detachment, separation, as you may, from all other allegiances. Everything. Through giving our total allegiance to Jesus Christ as master. Remember, no one can serve two masters. You have only one master, and that, oh, that one master is Jesus Christ. That is what we pledge as we entered the life of discipleship. 
We understood, we understand, we must remind ourselves, we must continually remind ourselves, brethren, to count the cost. Because we understand that nothing else must preempt our allegiance to Christ. Neither family, as we can read here in verse 26, it says, if any man come to me and does not hate his father or mother and so on, he cannot be my disciple. So nothing, neither family, as we just read in verse 26, nor wealth, as you can read in chapter 12, verse 13 to 21, no one's own life, as again, verse 26, no anything at all. He does not forsake, we must be willing to forsake everything. In Mark chapter 13, let's notice what Jesus Christ states here. Mark chapter 13 and verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy, he goes over it, he goes over it, and for joy over it, sorry, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he has found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now the question then we must ask ourselves continually. We may not think about it but again this is the reality we face brethren. Is the hidden treasure still as valuable to us as the first time our eyes were opened to see it exist. Hop back to when you first understood the purpose of life. How excited was that? How awesome was that? How valuable was that, brethren? That was hidden treasure that was God opened our eyes to see. Have we allowed it to lose its value by not carefully maintaining it? Have we allowed, remember, as we just read, remember the pearl of great price? Remember the pearl? Have we allowed it again to lose its luster, to lose its value by not carefully maintaining it? One of the face of this earth can be more valuable than the priceless privilege of knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can even come close. Brethren, are we continuing to count the cost? Are we continuing to give our total commitment to what we did earlier? The next thing we like to look at is going on to full maturity. Going on to full maturity require that we control the way we use our tongue. This is something that affects all of us in one way or another. Let's notice, uh, notice what the Apostle James, the Apostle James has a lot to say about this. Let's just most is a few things. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse, let's begin in verse 22. James 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Again, if you notice, do you see a pattern here? Doing, hearing, the, the incredible importance of, of it. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer 
but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Hearing, doing. Now, in the next verse here, in the next verse, in the verse that follows, the Apostle James begins a series of admonitions in this epistle on the use of the tongue. Verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious. Now, notice the word thinks. This is a very subjective. And does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religious religion is useless. The Greek word can also, also translate it in vain, worthless. This verse is very graphic. James does not hold back here. This is plain talking by the Apostle James. No one can somehow gloss over the meaning of what James is saying here. Now, the way that is graphic to us in this sense, it pictures a man putting a bridle in his mouth and not that of another. You know, we usually put bridles and horses and whatever, but here's an individual has this bridle. Instead of putting it on his horse, he takes it and puts it on himself. Kind of a, a ludicrous picture, you might say, but I think it gets, it gets, the, gets the effect that, that it needs to get. Now, the word translated bridle figuratively figuratively means to restrain, to govern, to exercise self-control. So the expression does not bridle his tongue can be translated as one who cannot tie his tongue down or one who cannot stop talking. Has that ever happened to you? Think about it, brethren. We're quite familiar with the fact that children say embarrassing things in front of others because they have not come to the level of maturity to control the tongue. That's just, you know, it's, they're not doing it out of harm or, to, or, or, or maliciousness. They just may see something and they just blurt it out. They haven't learned to control their tongue. But as Christians, brethren, going on to maturity demands, absolutely demands that we control the way we use our tongue. As James brings out here, controlling the use of the tongue has to do with self-control. Now, this is right in line with Paul's admonition to the Hebrews. You need to come to the full growth that is required of a Christian. Let's notice what David said in Psalm 39 and verse 1. Psalm 39 and verse 1. This is very revealing here. Psalm 39 and verse 1. David writes, I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. Very interesting statement. I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. Remember, it, gets, it gives us the same picture that we just read in James. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. How many of us consider the fact that we can be sinning with our tongues when we are speaking to or speaking about another person? This is what it says here, lest I sin with my tongue. We see here that David, David exemplified an individual whose religion was not worthless. He was an example of one whose religion was not in vain because he said he restrained his mouth with a muzzle. He understood David understood what can cause 
him to sin with his tongue. I will guard my ways. Self-control with the tongue begins in the mind. It can become so easy to fall into sin with the tongue, especially when the wicked and their wicked deeds are all around us. We see it every day. Every day. It's very easy to sin with the tongue, as David said. I restrain my mouth while the wicked, I restrain my mouth with a muscle, exercise in self-control while the wicked is before me. Let's go back to James again. This time James chapter 3 and verse 1. James write, James chapter 3 and verse 1. James write, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, let's note here, brethren, that James is using becoming teachers in a different context than what Paul wrote to the Hebrews. Here we find James is referring to being a teacher in the context of one whom God has appointed to teach. One whom God has given the gift of teaching. And goes on to show the seriousness of the accountability with which God holds that individual. It says, Knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Continuing in verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word. New American Standard translate that of what he says. In anyone, if anyone does not stumble in word or what he says. He's a perfect man. Able to bridle the whole body. So James continue by saying. All of us make mistakes. And the word that translated stumble means to slip, to err, to sin. And notice James includes himself. He does not exclude himself. He says we, we all stumble in many things. One of the easiest sin to fall into and can have severe consequences is the sin which result, which is a result of something that is said, the use of the tongue. Jesus Christ said back in Matthew 12 and verse 37, Matthew 12 and verse 37, Jesus Christ said, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. That statement was by Jesus Christ was the concluding statement of the teaching Christ had just given. Let's uh, go up a few verses and notice what Jesus has said in verse 35. <clears throat> Matthew 12 and verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bring forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idol, that word can also translate, that word can also mean careless, injurious. Take note of this. We all need to take note of this, brethren. For every idol, every careless, every injurious word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. And remember, our day of judgment is now. Today. Right now. Not sometime off in the future. So we can see how James came to recognize that controlling, that the controlling of one's tongue as a decisive, has a decisive matter in influencing the entirety of one's life. Again, if anyone, back in James again, if anyone does not stumble in word or what he says, he's a perfect man. Now the word translated perfect means one, the one who has reached his goal. 
The one who has reached his goal. That's one of the meanings of, of the word. Now, it is not the goal that we set for ourselves, but the goal and the standard set by God for us. We don't set the goal. We don't set the standard. God is the one who tells us what the standards are. Now, and that standard, that goal is perfection, nothing less. Now, even though that goal is hard to reach, we can never cease striving for it. Now, this word, same word, perfect, can also refer to spiritual maturity. So, in effect, then, James is saying that those who, those who control their speech are well on their way to spiritual maturity. These are the things we need to think about and take action. So the basic principle then is, if you can control what you say, you can control the rest of what you do. The problem is, the problem we all face, is that words have a way of escaping our mouths before they are carefully considered, sometimes with unfortunate results. As Proverbs 18.21 states, you don't have to turn there, Proverbs 18.21 states, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What a power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, the reason James places so much emphasis on words is because he is relating what he had learned from Jesus Christ. And the reality is, words are the expression of that which is in the heart and mind. They are voluntary words that are the expression of our inner thoughts. The question then, brethren, how many times do we think seriously about how much our words will cost before we say them? Words can cost a lot, as we just see in Proverbs. Let's notice in James, again, back in James chapter 3. We're still in James. Continuing in verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds, proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, James said, these things ought not to be so. Now again, remember, James, the Apostle James, is addressing members of the body of Christ, not the world. And he understand, James understand, that we may still have very much, that we still have the old nature in us, which can flare up, can flare out of control at any moment if we are not careful. If we are not carefully keeping a handle, watching ourselves. And there's not a lack of things in the world we are living in. More and more, brethren, that can trigger the tongue to get out of control. James, bring out, James brings out here the nature of the unsettled tongue. He states, it is unruly or unrestrainable evil, full of deadly poison. This is, this is pretty strong language James is using here. Again, he's not tiptoeing around anything. James is being very blunt and forthright. It is an unruly, an unrestrainable evil, full of deadly poison. What James is describing here is how the old nature in us drives the operation of the tongue. The word translated evil has the connotation of evil that is hidden. It is hidden within and does not necessarily hurt or annoy others. It's within until something causes it to burst out. 
The word deals with the nature of a person or a thing. Man can train his tongue to say certain things. We hear that every day. Man can train his tongue to say certain things and behave in certain ways, but he cannot change his nature. He cannot change the nature of, its, of his tongue of and by himself, which is evil. Now, James Cole also calls the tongue unruly, which means ungovernable. So the tongue is an evil that man of and by himself cannot hold down, cannot control. Now, when, when, when he uses the term deadly poison, deadly poison means something that is sent out. Hence, venom that serpents eject from their fangs. This is, again, pretty graphic language he's using here. Someone may pride themselves on their candor. You know, I speak my mind. I say it the way it is. Well, someone may pride themselves on how, can, how candid they are, or how they forthright. But that could be one step away. That could be one step away from, being, from, from hitting someone over the head with a, with, with a hammer. it can easily degenerate into brutality like a sack of poison ejecting from a serpent's fang. <clears throat> so we see here, brethren, James takes the Christian to task by decrying the use of a tongue as a tool of hypocrisy. In order to bless God, we usually, we have, to, we have to utilize our tongue. We usually use our tongue when we bless God. The word translated bless means to speak well of. We, as, we Christians speak well of God. And again, we normally do it with our tongues. We can praise and bless God. But the question is, does the good that we speak of God backed up by what we say about one another does it? So for this person, my friend, it has praise, but for another, my enemy, it has slander. For a friend, it speaks a blessing, but for an enemy, it speaks a curse. So what James is saying here is that the tongue is a little hypocrite in our mouths that can make a big hypocrite out of us. Let's consider this, brethren. The next thing we want to examine in our journey to maturity, in our journey to perfection, is going on to perfection required that we forget the things that are behind and press forward to the things ahead. Now, this is one of the most difficult things we will ever do as a Christian, but it must be done if we are to go on to perfection, it absolutely must be done if we are to go on to perfection. Let's notice what the Apostle Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Reading this from Green's literal translation. Philippians 3 and verse 12. Not that... Not that I already received or already have been perfected, but I press on. The, the Greek interlinear states, I am pursuing. I press on. If I also may lay hold inasmuch as I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, Paul continues, verse 13. I do not count myself to have laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things, stretching forward to those things before. I press on for the mark or the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We see here, brethren, 
Paul begins this section with a disclaimer. He's right up front with a disclaimer. Even after all he has gone through up to this point in his life, he explicitly stated he had not yet reached the goal of perfection. Now due to his deep feelings of, of affection he, towards the brethren at Philippi, he did not want them to reach the wrong conclusion when he mentioned he had suffered the loss of all things in order to gain Christ, as we can see in verse, in verse 8, where he said he suffered the loss of all things. But God wants us to understand through the life of individuals such as Paul that even though perfection will not be attained in the flesh, we must spare no effort in striving towards the goal. Remember, it is God who sets the goal for us. We do not set the goal for ourselves. Paul repeatedly states that he is imperfect by stating not that I had already obtained or, or, or have already been perfected. He fully understands what his status is. And then shows us what he's doing in light of that understanding. Now brethren, this is where we fall short on two counts. Number one, being unaware of the reality of our spiritual condition. And number two, failing to resolve to our utmost to correct the situation. Now the word translated press, press on, means to move rapidly and decisively towards an object. To pursue with earnestness and diligence in order to obtain. Spiritually dragging your feet is deadly. Anyone who spiritually drags their feet, there are problems. Problems that will result. Serious problems, as we're going to see in a minute. Paul considers that his conversion was figuratively, figuratively a seizure. He was seized, he said. He was... He was uh, he was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ figuratively laid hold on him on his way to Damascus to put an end to his zealous persecutions of Christ's own disciples. When Christ did that, Paul instantly yielded to what Christ did and turned his energy to zealously pursue the very reason for which Christ laid hold on him. What was that reason? Paul tells us what that reason is in, in verse 10. Jumping up, looking a couple of verses prior to this. Philippians 3 and verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I, might, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Simply put, brethren, to become a part of the God family. That is the reason why Christ laid hold on Paul. And Paul responded. Now Paul shows that in order for this to be accomplished in his life, he was laser focused on doing one thing. Remember we read this? But one thing I do. That was his focus. That was his singular focus. Forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things before. Now, you may say that this, there are two things that he's talking about, but this is really one action in two parts. When we repent, God blots out our past. These things are no, are no longer held against us. We are no longer held, we are no longer guilty before God. 
Our guilt has been erased. Of course, again, key, repentance. First, first it must come. Repentance comes first. So God erases our past. Jesus Christ states in Luke verse, chapter 9 and verse 62. You don't have to turn there. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. Quite familiar with this. Jesus said to him, No one, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This again is one of the sobering statements that we have to consider. Looking, what looking back means for us. Now even though Paul looked back on his life with deep regret. Certain things that he had done. And you can read what he states in Acts 22. As far, but as far as his forgetting was concerned. The past was the past. When Paul states in this is the fact of my past. This is what I did in the past. But he did not let those hinder him from going forward. As far as he was concerned, again, the past was in the past. And there was nothing that he could do to change it. How about us, brethren? What can we do to change what is in our past? What can we do to change what happened in the past? He had learned his lesson. You know, we've heard the term lessons learned. Sometimes we use those term, we use that term flippantly. We didn't really learn anything. But Paul learned his lesson. He had also learned to deal with the consequence of the choices he had made. But from the time Paul repented and was struck down by Christ, he never looked back. He acknowledged his past, as I just said, but it did not control him. He had repented, and God forgave him, but he never kept beating himself up. He never kept beating himself up for what happened in his past. And the reality is, brethren, not going on to perfection can have very serious consequences. Very serious consequences. Let's continue in back in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. After Paul goes on again, not casting down your, your foundation and so on, mentions repentance from dead works and so on and so forth. Let's pick up the account in verse 4. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. Paul states, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Christ died for our sins once. That's it. Paul says, Christ is not going to come back again and crucify. I mean, if they, if they, if they fail to do these things, if we, if we fail to do these things, if we fail to take advantage of what we have been given. Then he says it is impossible. If, if they fall away. Now Paul goes on. If you can read um, the, the later part of this chapter. Where he says you, you know but you know what. You know I, I think you. I can, I can think that there's a better way for you. You don't have to fall into this. You don't have to do this. As he says here. In verse 9, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. So Paul was an optimist. He wanted, to, he wanted to believe the best for them. 
But this was a warning that each, of our, each and every one of us must take to heart. Christ died once for our sins. We must use the power God has given to us to go on to perfection. We must stretch forth with every fiber of our being towards that goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. And what is that? Entrance into the family of God. Now, Paul states towards the end of his life, we can read this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. You don't have to turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul states, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Again, he strove and he strove. He pressed on and he pressed on. He did not allow the things behind him to hold him back. Brethren, let's never forget. Let's never forget that God has already this prize waiting for us. It is a gift to us. But we must go on to perfection. We must go on to perfection. We must fight the good fight. We must finish the race. We cannot drop out any time before the race has ended. This race, brethren, demands our total dedication and commitment. It demands that we overcome the distraction of our lives that keep us from pressing forward. It demands that we pay the, most earn, the more earnest heed to the things through the words of our master and follow what he said in Matthew 5 and verse 48, which we all know. Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus states, therefore, therefore, after all he has said before, therefore you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Brethren, this is our call to action now. And next time we'll examine more of these calls to action.